autism. It's a word you may already be familiar with. Most people have a rough idea of what autism is. After all, 700,000 people in the UK exist somewhere on the autism spectrum. Asperger's syndrome is described as a high functioning form of this condition. Those with Asperger's syndrome are generally indistinguishable from your average person. They often go without the social support that others on the autistic spectrum receive. They are given special education to help them fit better into society, but they stand as some of the most vulnerable individuals at all stages of life. At school, they are bullied, socially isolated. In adulthood, 70% of autistics receive a significant lack of support from social services, and at least one in three live with severe mental health difficulties. Despite a strong presence in the world of scientific research and social awareness, it stands as perhaps the most misunderstood condition in our society. In this documentary, I'm going to explore the reasons behind this mental health crisis and tease out whether it's an issue of biology or whether it's social. I would mainly describe autism to someone who doesn't have it as someone who doesn't have autism has all of the social and body language characteristics innate within them. I'd say that it's kind of like a list of traits that like come in many different combinations, but there are ways a few that are, that are the trend between those people. I'd describe autism in the realm of social communication, social isolation, and also the, the repetitive, obsessive nature of, of, of life. So hobbies, interests that you become slightly fixed with and, and you can't, can't really think about anything else. So If you're neurotypical, which is basically not being autistic, uh, then you like you see life as a colour screen TV, you can hear all the voices... You can see what's going on, you can follow the plot of whatever's on the telly. But when you're autistic, it's like it's black and white TV and it's a bit fuzzy. And so you're missing some of the information, visual and uh, oral. So you're only really getting part of the picture of what's happening around you. And you've got to find ways to interpret that. But there's fine social communication really difficult while some can be quite chatty. And I think the main thing is that literal interpretation of anything that they're asked to do or that they're told. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a funny question. I think it's a good question because I think most autistic people would say yes and no. One thing that I tend to like about being autistic is that I've had to learn my emotions, learn social, social interactions. So it's made me earn those things as opposed to being in doubt with them. I think I would say on the whole, I, I would, yeah, I'd say I like being autistic. It obviously has its, its drawbacks, but... I really like being autistic. Um, it's very liberating to, to know that you're autistic because it's, it's something that I think is like a, an integral part of your personality, or at least it has been for me my whole life. Uh, it, it has its difficulties, obviously, but I think it's part of what makes me me, and I wouldn't change that. An autistic spectrum disorder is described as a complex developmental disability. 
Asperger's syndrome is a relatively high-functioning form of autism, meaning that those who are diagnosed with this condition generally seem to be quite normal and often have IQ scores that surpass your average person. In the 1970s, a popular autism researcher named Lorna Wing developed the triad of impairments to explain the signs of Asperger's syndrome in children. The triad has three different but important aspects to it. The first being communication and language difficulties, characterized by a difficulty understanding and using both nonverbal and verbal communication. The second aspect is difficulties with social interaction. This means that they find it extremely hard to understand social behavior, and this can impact their ability to make friends, develop relationships, and develop healthy relationships with their coworkers. The third sign is perhaps the most difficult trait to spot. It's characterized by rigidity in thought, but it's also characterized by an inflexibility in behavior. The rigid thinking manifests as a difficulty understanding another person's point of view. The inflexibility in behavior usually manifests itself as difficulties coping with changes in routine and daily life. The triad is by no means a conclusive list of the problems autistics face in our society, but it can give us an idea of why autistics tend to be more socially isolated and distressed than their neurotypical counterparts. For the first part of my journey, I wanted to get a good idea of how non-autistics viewed autism. To get a realistic view, I needed to interview someone with experience of autism, but it wasn't just enough to choose someone with formal training on supporting autistics, so I decided I would pay a visit to my Taekwondo instructor. I knew from previous experience that he's trained many people both on and off the autistic spectrum. Hopefully, I could get an idea of how autism appears to the general public, how people adjust their views, and some of the trials and tribulations they experience when trying to understand autistic people. <laughs> So I'm the lead coach here at Horizon Taekwondo, so um, I guess being older and more experienced, my role here is to lead the other coaches. I also teach classes as well, so I coach on a class level and an individual level within the organisation. Um, I definitely think it does actually because it, it, it brings, I guess, more of, a, more of an environment of normality to people with sort of disabilities and learning difficulties because normally they'll be within, I guess, social care groups where it's disability only or learning difficulties only, whereas it, it's more of an environment that's inclusive so everyone's there, so everyone learns from each other. So people like myself would learn what people with learning difficulties are, are all about and, and not sort of um, stigmatise those people and you know, put them into one box. And then I guess the people with learning difficulties, uh, challenging behaviour and various disabilities, they be around people like myself and sort to learn uh, at a different rate, I guess, um, because you're around people that are different to what you would normally be um, put in. I guess through the various education routes and work routes and social groups. Oh, yes, definitely. Um, and that's through a lack of understanding from myself and it only became a problem because of my lack of awareness. So for example, some of the learning difficulties joins our club. You know, the, the immediate assumption may be they're all the same, you know, um, all people with autism, for example, are the same. Well, actually not. Everyone in, is an individual, regardless of whether they have learning difficulties or not. Various things that sort of cause conflict within the club is lack of awareness of the actual disability from the rest of the participants. I, I don't think it's, it's more of a, um, 
lack of tolerance, because I think people in, this, in the UK especially are very tolerant and adaptive. I think it's just lack of awareness because it isn't that, you know, someone with learning difficulties walks in and, you know, they always, you know, we'll put a special bib on them to wear so everyone's aware. It's not like that. That's not how we want to run. We want everyone to be treated the same. I think so, yeah, because normally um, people go through an education system which is a one-size-fits-all, whereas sports such as Taekwondo and, and well, I guess every sports individual is different, but it, it's just a different type of learning. So in, in the Taekwondo club that we have, obviously there's, there's the physical aspects which you won't get in any other sport, you won't get it through the standard education system. And there's also the, um, the sort of self-independent side, so um, in the Taekwondo sport, you've got, you've got to be independent, you've got to learn for yourself, you've got, you've got to act more mature, you've, you've got to be a self-starter. And there's also the social side as well, so yeah, while you might be fighting in the ring on your own, you know, you're on your own, but you're supported by a coach and you're supported by a big partisan uh, atmosphere of a crowd. Uh, and when you're training, you've got a team of people around you, so it does teach social skills as well. And then people with learning difficulties, who come into the club and not have well-versed, well-exercised, well-seasoned social skills, but being in, in the team environment, they've got no choice but to adapt. So, um, having autism, I don't think, is a disability in, in, in life generally. I think everyone is born and you have what you have whether you have autism, whether you have learning difficulties, whether you are super intelligent or not, it doesn't really matter to me. I find that people with, with autism are very, very um, driven, provided we can get the right environment around people, you can get the best out of people, and I find people with autism do try much, much harder, more focused, and they stick to schedules much better. So if we have a schedule, and therefore a routine, that these people will do that particular schedule and learn faster and get physically better, physically stronger and mentally stronger because of the schedule and their adherence to that schedule. So when I was growing up I was, I was brought up around people with learning difficulties and various disabilities. When I came into teaching Taekwondo I had that life experience uh, but at the time I felt yeah, I know everything. I know everything about people learning difficulties and, and disabilities because I've been brought up around it. But no, there's a lot more to it. Everyone is different. And while I might have made reasonable adjustments for one person joining our club, that's, you need something different for someone else that may join who has learning difficulties because not everyone's the same. But what does make me proud is people with disabilities we've had over the years. We've got to Black Belt, we've got to Black Belt Second Dan, we've got them to international competing level. Why should it be that you know, this person walks through the door and they've got everything available to them, but this other person walks through the door and, yeah, they've got a disability of some sort or learning difficulties. No, they start closing the doors, that just doesn't seem right to me. I think everyone should have the same access to everything based on, you know, what their availability is and what their level is. Rick's interview gave me a lot to think about. It was apparent that he showed a genuine understanding of autism. He challenged a lot of initial prejudgments people can have, but he also reflected on how he previously thought about the condition. To further the story, I needed another angle on the experience. Someone with a more intimate relationship with autism. This. <laughs> Sometimes with autism is it obviously disadvantages you socially to, to a really great extent, which kind of means you depend on meeting certain types of people, and those people don't have to be autistic, but they are usually people who aren't completely normal either. When you're growing up, it's difficult because you're always kind of progressing onto that next stage, stage of, um, of school or, or sixth form or whatever, university, to get that... Stability of friends, you've got to reach a kind of 
the, you know, the end of your teenage years, and, and that's that's what's difficult, I think. And um, if you're not particularly good at making new friends, and it's it's a it's a difficult one when it's constantly changing so much. So in terms of romantic relationships, I had my first girlfriend at seventeen. It was uh, a four month relationship. Didn't really go well because of my well lack of experience and just being new to it. Which I guess you could attribute more to just being seventeen than being autistic. I used to have sort of like a small group of friends at school. But in general, I do find it hard to maintain friendships. So I think, um, on average, for an autistic person, I've done quite well socially, because I've been quite lucky with who I've known. Um, not to say there haven't been problems, and I've very often felt misunderstood by people around me. That's, that's more or less a universal experience uh, for people with autism. So I was diagnosed, diagnosed with autism at the age of three um, because I wasn't responding to my own name. Um, and one of the things that was kind of picked up in nursery was um, the teacher would say, would address the class and I would not respond to it due to me not recognizing myself as the rest of the class, but I'm Adam, I'm not class. Yeah, um, I found school really difficult. I absolutely hate it. I think the most difficult thing was sort of being autistic, but not being aware of it, aware of it at the time, because I was only diagnosed at 19, so through all the school I did not have any support at all. Autism at school, in pretty much every other aspect, was hell. <laughs> because the thing is, if it, I... If I tried, if I even dared to speak about my interests with people my own age, I would just be mocked for it. Well, when I was at school, yeah, I was, I was driven about filmmaking, which is, you know, it's just turned into my, you know, my career ultimately. Yeah. Because I was on YouTube and I was making films and I was putting it out there, I was, you know, making myself a very open person. It left me, yeah, quite, quite vulnerable in the sense that when I was at school, it was a, a case where, yeah, people picked on me because of it, and, and that probably, yeah, created a bit of a negative experience. School is all, unfortunately, about fitting in, you know, and if you don't fit the crowd, then, then naturally you're going you're gonna to stand out and you're going to be picked on. Every autistic person he's met was traumatised by their experience at school, assuming they went to a mainstream school. So I certainly would say that applies to me. I found it very traumatic. With the thoughts of the previous interview still clear in my mind, I decided to interview someone with a strong understanding of autism, but also someone with a good background in formal training. It just so happens that someone in my own family has a strong role in the realm of special needs and public awareness. So I travelled down to my hometown Harrogate to pit the brains of someone I believe had a lot of important things to say. Okay, so... Um, I started out as a primary school teacher and was linked with a lot of schools that had autism specialists. So um, I learned a lot about autism and special needs and wanted to sort of broaden my interest. So I, I did a lot of courses and then eventually went for a job as a teacher in charge of um, specialist provision which provided an outreach service to about 100 schools in North Yorkshire. So what I do is I go in and I advise them on how to teach children with autism and Asperger's, how to support them, how to support their families. Um, I write some of the training for North Yorkshire. Um, <clears throat> I also deliver training to uh, parents in workshops as well, post-diagnosis. So it's quite varied as well as teaching children directly on inReach. Um, a lot of it's an advisory role. I think, I think there's a lot of difficulties with teaching children on the spectrum. There's an awful lot of strengths, but a lot of our children are misunderstood, particularly girls that mask their social skills um, because they're very good at copying the girls and they're naturally more sociable so that can be really difficult. Um, I think the thing that I underestimated with children on the spectrum is um, the level of anxiety that can be caused by 
um, social communication can also be usually caused by any sensory needs as well and that's really underestimated. Later on, particularly children with Asperger's um, can develop mental health difficulties because of high anxiety and trying to fit with social norms. I don't think we need to like break down that, that need to fit with social norms at a young age. I personally, I think any difference should be celebrated. I don't see autism or anything else as a disability. We always talk about differences, a disability. It is a very different way of thinking. I quite often describe it as having an Xbox and a PS4. They've both got the same purpose and function, but they're just hardwired differently. The children that I work with or have worked with are an absolute joy. They're very affectionate, they're very empathic. They can develop skills very quickly. They're very intu they're quite intuitive quite often. Very, very kind and very, but actually very vulnerable very vulnerable to other children, society, other people. You are autistic, yeah, you are typically developing, yeah, you are whatever label, but you're still just you, you are that unique person, you are individual and you can do what you need to do. Probably one of the most important aspects are to raise awareness, but not just to raise awareness of autism, because I know there's been a lot on television. Because quite often we get children not invited to parties, or we get um, children that are not understood, and their their children are asked to stay away from them. So I've started in schools doing a little bit more of um, inviting inviting parents of of children that are typically developing to come to workshops so that they can understand autism better. I think having experienced the mental health systems that are currently in place, I think there needs to be a lot more psychiatrists and psychologists that have a particular skill or particular specialism with autism. Because we know that people that have just general skills don't actually think outside the box to how somebody is wired. So it has to be done in a very, very different way. And we've myself I've searched for psychiatrists and psychologists that can do that job post 18 and there is a gap there is a huge gap honestly I was so shocked at just how much insight Michelle gave us she highlighted some of the major problems children on the spectrum experience at school and that we have a large gap in the number of doctors able to treat mental health in adults. All of this gave me a lot of insight into why autistics are so often isolated and alienated. I spent the next few weeks pondering about who could give me the other side to the story. It was going to be very difficult to find someone with an experience of autism in adults. I needed someone to give me a more personal understanding of the problems autistics face. Yeah, I feel it's a lot like mental health, but the problem because, especially with those who are less severe, it's not noticeable really, and people aren't aware, understand that just because someone doesn't look typically autistic or whatever, it doesn't mean that they haven't got any issues at all and just like with anyone else, treat them as an individual. Yeah, I've evolved to, to fit into the environment that I live in, you know, and and therefore it would be strange for, for society to, to adapt to a minority, I guess. Um, I suppose there needs to be a, a degree of acceptance about fitting into autistic people. This whole reasonable adjustment thing needs to be made a big, big deal of. As far as changing the way that society views autism, I feel like it's definitely changed a lot throughout my lifetime. Personally, I feel like um, society is very accepting and all that. Personally, in my adult life, I've had absolutely no concerns when I've told anyone that I'm autistic. It's not something that I regularly tell people. Uh, I feel that um, 
society is moving in the right direction, actually. I feel that people are learning more. I don't think it's that people are willfully ignorant when the problems happen. It's mostly because they, they don't know what to do. But I think if people want to improve things further, I, there's lots of things, but basically if you really listen to what we say about our experience and what's difficult, and if, if anything, autistic people tend to underplay their difficulties. Being autistic is accommodating the entire universe that doesn't understand you. Just, just think, autistic people are, com are accommodating you all the time. <laughs> if you don't think autistic people are accommodating you, you don't know any autistic people. And sometimes a little bit back, a little bit, a, just a little bit of effort the other way would be enough. <laughs> with much difficulty, I managed to get in contact with the co-founder of Salford Autism, a charity focused on supporting autistics in difficult, everyday situations. With a diagnosis of Asperger syndrome and a strong dedication to improving the lives of autistics, I was sure he had a lot to bring to the table. So I finished up joining an embryonic local support group, which was just come down, have a cup of tea and a chat and see where to from there. And that developed into what is now Salford Autism. We have clients who are what many would see as a classically autistic person, but our client list also includes surgeons, engineers, local authority ma management. So we would get between them and a landlord, an employer, benefit system, local authorities, etc. and pretty much negotiate for either side to help each other to understand the other's point of view in the situation. No. I spent the last six years listening to autistic people and listening to the problems that they have and how they often can't articulate the problem and having to work with that. But other than that, reading and talking to people that are supposedly experts of all sorts of description in the area, no formal training. The frightening thing is that more and more people seem to agree with me. We only really work with autistic people, but by that I am including families. At the end of the day, autism is a genetic condition. You inherit it from your parents, you pass it on to your children. There is no debate about that. How it expresses in an individual is very much subject to that individual's makeup and the environmental circumstances around that person. So it may well be that any given family it's the most extreme individual that gets the diagnosis first. The difficulty with some can be that they tend to pretend they're normal against all the evidence, especially young people, teenagers and early 20s. They're so busy trying to live a life, trying to find out what, ha what life has in store for them. The last thing they want to be discussing is how they are different from everybody else. They don't want to be forced to accept help that they don't see they need. And unfortunately, they are so busy refusing this help, they often don't see the pitfalls coming until too late. Then we find ourselves in crisis mode, trying to get under the axe before it actually lands. And we're not always successful. The biggest problem that we see from non-autistic people is as a result of working with them because of the involvement of an autistic person and they really have no idea. None whatsoever. They may have read a book, they may have seen a film, they may have heard about it, but because they've not put any time into it, they've not put any time into understanding the individual, all they're left with is cliched preconceptions about what autism is supposed to be. Almost everybody universally 
is so sold on their preconceptions of whatever they see, it's difficult to get them to see it differently. every day. One of the beauties, I won't say joys, because sometimes it can be quite difficult, of working with autistic people is that everyone is radically different. There's always something new to learn about every person and from every person. But there is also the joy that I have never come across a nasty autistic person. I've never come across an autistic person that would steal I've never come across an autistic person that would tell lies either to harm somebody else or for their own advantage. We seem to be much more focused on what is right and proper. Would I like it if somebody did this to me? It really is a revelation every time I speak to an autistic person. The problems they deal with, how they deal with it, how they perceive those problems and how they perceive the interactions with other people. And unpeeling that onion is always revealing. So as much as I spend my time helping other people, in itself, it is an education for me. The best person I've ever come across for dealing with autistic people professed to know nothing about autistic people but she was just genuinely kind, accepting, non-judgmental and seeking to help. It didn't matter whether you had autism or learning disabilities or were in a wheelchair. She was just there. What can I do to help? Now, if the rest of the world would actually start adhering to the various religions that they profess, even if it's just humanism and became nicer people, Autistic people would have all the help they need. What we need is space. People to cut us a little bit of slack, not expect to measure up to their expectations of how to behave. A little bit of tolerance for the times we have a wobble. If somebody has a couple of drinks at an office party, nobody condemns them for the rest of their career about being a little bit silly after midnight. So why should anybody condemn an autistic person for doing something that they may not have known was an issue. If the world was a nicer place, autism would not be a problem. We would just be people. Slightly different, but we'd just be people. That is the biggest thing autism needs. Social is all. Autism does not necessarily come with any physical characteristics. The social model of disability is the most applicable to autism because there is nothing disabling per se about autism. It might make life more difficult, but if society would stop expecting us to behave to a standard that they think is normal and just accepted that we are the way we are, with all our twists and turns and abnormalities, they would start to realise that none of the things they see as being different matter. They just don't matter. Yes, meltdowns are a problem, but so is epilepsy. Nobody worries too much about an epileptic. They know what to do and they just deal with it when they find one. If people would have a little bit more information and just be a little bit more charitable, we need to educate non-autistic people in the right way to understand how autism works, what it is, what it isn't. And we also need to educate autistic people that all of us are different, but none of us are broken. I started off with an idea of what autism was and why autistics face so many problems in our society. My interviews with Rick gave me a lot of insight into how someone's opinions can change about the condition. He also taught me just how crucial getting an in-depth, personal understanding of Asperger's is to the world. With Michelle, 
she gave a great outsider's perspective on autism in children and what may be at the heart of the problems they face in adult life. And lastly, Peter helped me understand the actual issues autistics struggle with and just how important small acts of kindness and understanding are to the lives of these people. It wasn't just these individuals. Throughout the process, I got a strong appreciation for just how diverse and different autistics can be from each other. Their experiences, their struggles, their outlooks on life, and most importantly, the strength that's required to face these issues head on. There's a lot to learn from the things we've seen today. Will it really make a difference? Are we going to ignore the issues facing autistic people? At the end of the day, they spent their entire life learning about you, learning to adapt to a society that is not built for them. Just as everyone else in this world, all they need is to feel like they're understood and loved for who they are. A little kindness, acceptance, and tolerance can make a huge difference. Yeah, I mean, autistic people have a, have a lot to, to offer the world. They've got incredible uh, intelligence, incredible um, skills and abilities, and incredible dedication and motivation. We, we've got to respect that the fact that autistic people can be successful and can change the world, you know? Well, based on the prevalence of, of autistics in science and literature and all that, I would say that there's, as I've said earlier, that, autism, that autistics have a lot to offer the world in terms of um, moving the world forward in technology, but also um, I don't like to differentiate autistics from anyone else, so I'd say what do autistics have to offer the world? As much or as little as anyone else. I think honesty and being able to get to the heart of the problem and cut through all the uh, BS <laughs> that other people focus on and can't move on from. Well, again, it depends on the person. I think most autistic people can think for themselves and can often really perceive what's going on in society. So again, it's like if more autistic voices are heard, I think it would benefit everyone because we tend to be more t detached kind of emotionally, which can come across as being quite cold hearted, but it's, it's not that at all. It's just the way we process stuff is, is very different. Autistic, in its original definition, as defined by Spurger and his colleagues, was like the outsider. The autistics were the children that weren't spending time with the other children. And, and that, that is a bit of a problem, <laughs> because it, it means that there's this association, this connotation that will always be there. There's no reason why autistic people can't can't just be like people, have normal relationships, normal lives. You are entitled to, to live a life just as everyone else does.